Section Seven of the Book of Halloween by Ruth Edna Kelly. Chapter Seven: Halloween Beliefs and Customs in Ireland. Ireland has a literature of Halloween, or Samhain, as it used to be called. Most of it was written between the seventh and the twelfth centuries, but the events were thought to have happened while paganism still ruled in Ireland. The evil powers that came out at Samhain lived the rest of the time in the cave of Cruachan in Connaught the province which was given to the wicked Fomer after the battle of Moitura. This cave was called the Gate Hell of Ireland, and was unlocked on November Eve to let out spirits and copper-colored birds, which killed the farm animals. They also stole babies, leaving in their place changelings, goblins who were old in wickedness while still in the cradle, possessing superhuman cunning and skill in music. One way of getting rid of these demon children was to ill-treat them so that their people would come for them, bringing the right ones back, or one might boil eggshells in the sight of the changeling, who would declare his demon nature by saying that, in his centuries of life, he had never seen such a thing before. Even after Christianity was made the vital religion in Ireland, it was believed that places not exercised by prayers and by the sign of the cross were still haunted by druids. As late as the fifth century, the druids kept their skill in fortune-telling. King Dathi got a druid to foretell what would happen to him from one Halloween to the next, and the prophecy came true. Their religion was now declared evil, and all evil, or at any rate suspicious things, were assigned to them or to the devil as followers. The power of fairy music was so great that St. Patrick himself was put to sleep by a minstrel who appeared to him on the day before Samhain. These infamous spirits dwelt in grassy mounds, called forts, which were the entrances to underground palaces full of treasure, where was always music and dancing. These treasure-houses were only open on November Eve, when the throngs of spirits, fairies, and goblins trooped out for revels about the country. For the fairy mounds of Erin are always opened about Halloween. The old druid idea of obsession, the besieging of a person by an evil spirit, was practiced by them at that time. A story is told of Patty Moore, a great, stout, uncivil churl, and Patty Begg, a cheerful little hunchback. The latter, seeing lights and hearing music, paused by a mound, and was invited in. Urged to tell stories, he complied. He danced as spryly as he could for his deformity. He sang and made himself so agreeable that the fairies decided to take the hump off his back and send him home a straight manly fellow. The next Halloween, who should come by the same place but Patty Moore, and he stopped likewise to spy at the merrymaking. He too was called in, but would not dance politely, added no stories nor songs. The fairies clapped Paddy Begg's hump on his back, and dismissed him under a double burden of discomfort. No place as much as Ireland has kept the belief in all sorts of supernatural spirits abroad among its people. From the time when the hill of Ward, near Terra, in pre-Christian days, the sacrifices were burned and the Tuatha were thought to appear on Samhain, to as late as 1910, testimony to actual appearance of the little people is to be found. Among the usually invisible races which I have seen in Ireland, I distinguish five classes. There are gnomes, who are earth spirits, and who seem to be a sorrowful race. I once saw some of them distinctly on the sign of Ben Bulban. They had rather round heads and dark, thick-set bodies, and in stature were about two and one-half feet. The leprechauns are different, being full of mischief, though they too are small. I followed a leprechaun from the town of Wicklow out to the Carrig Sida, rock of the fairies, a distance of half a mile or more, where he disappeared. He had a very merry face, and beckoned to me with his finger. A third class are the little people, who, unlike the gnomes and leprechauns, are quite good-looking, and they are very small. The good people are tall, beautiful beings, as tall as ourselves. They direct the magnetic currents of the earth. The gods are really the Tuatha de Danann, and they are much taller than our race. The sight of apparitions on Halloween is believed to be fatal to the beholder. One night my lady's soul walked along the wall like a cat. Long Tom Bowman beheld her, and that day week fell he into the well and was drowned. One version of the jack-o'-lantern story comes from Ireland. A stingy man named Jack was, for his inhospitality, barred from all hope of heaven, and because of practical jokes on the devil was locked out of hell. Until the judgment day is condemned to walk the earth with a lantern to light his way. The place of the old lord of the dead, the Tuatha god Salmon, to whom vigil was kept and prayers said on November Eve for the good of departed souls, was taken in Christian times by St. Columba, or Columkill, 
the founder of a monastery in Ionia in the 5th century. In the 17th century, the Irish peasants went about begging money and goodies for a feast, and demanding in the name of Columkill that fatted calves and black sheep be prepared. In place of the druid fires, candles were collected and lighted on Halloween, and prayers for the souls of the givers said before them. The name of Salmon is kept in the title Othic Samna, Vigil of Salmon, by which the night of October 31st was until recently called in Ireland. A popular drink at the Halloween gathering in the 18th century was milk in which crushed roasted apples had been mixed. It was called lamb's wool, perhaps from La Mas Upho, the day of the apple fruit. At the Halloween supper, Kalkanan, mashed potatoes, parsnips, and chopped onions is indispensable. A ring is buried in it, and the one who finds it in his portion will be married in a year, or if he is already married, will be lucky. After supper was over, all went into the big playroom, and dived for apples in a tub of water, fished for prizes in a basin of flour, then there were games. After supper the tests were tried. In the last century nut shells were burned. The best-known nut test is made as follows. Three nuts are named for a girl and two sweethearts. If one burns steadily with the girl's nut, that lover is faithful to her. But if either hers or one of the other nuts starts away, there will be no happy friendship between them. Apples are snapped from the end of a stick hung parallel to the floor by a twisted cord, which whirls the stick rapidly when it is let go. Care has to be taken not to bite the candle burning on the other end. Sometimes this test is made easier by dropping the apples into a tub of water and diving for them, or piercing them with a fork dropped straight down. Green herbs called livelong were plucked by the children and hung up on Midsummer Eve. If a plant was found to be still green on Halloween, the one who had hung it up would prosper for the year, but if it had turned yellow or had died, the child would also die. Hemp seed is sown across three furrows, the sower repeating, Hemp seed, I saw thee, hemp seed, I saw thee, and her that is to be my true love, come after me and draw thee. Just before midnight was the time to go out alone and unperceived to a south-running brook, dip a shirt-sleeve in it, bring it home, and hang it by the fire to die. One must go to bed, but watch till midnight for a sight of the destined mate who would come to turn the shirt to dry the other side. Ashes were raked smooth on the hearth at bedtime on Halloween, and the next morning examined for footprints. If one was turned from the door, guests or a marriage was prophesied. If turned toward the door, a death. End of section 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.